from the Charles Institute of Television and Universities. His books include Apollon with the Turgid Context, Text, Context, and Subtext, Subtext The Writing Comedy Reconstruction of the Lost Book of Apollon with the Context, Comic Book, uh, the Translation of Comic Book, as well as, as, well as uh, Translation of Book 4 of the Comic Book. Uh, Michael also works in mathematics education and has recently edited with Tommy Dreyfus, Mathematics and Mathematics Education, Searching for Common Ground. Michael came uh, about a year and a half ago and gave a lecture in the summer, uh, a lecture that was so well received uh, that it became clear to us that we had to invite him back as soon as we possibly could. Uh, and so, uh, he, so, so that's why he's here tonight, or he came just a year and a half after he lectured before. Uh, he, um, uh, so he, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons we wanted to have him this year was because this is our 50th anniversary year, and so the, the, the lectures this year are quite special. And so we wanted Michael to be part of that, uh, part of that uh, series of lectures. I wanted to say one last thing. Michael and I graduated together uh, from Annapolis in 1982. We have been very, very good friends for many, many years. We've had many, many conversations over a long period of time, on and off, over those 30, more than 30 years. Um, over the period of time, the conversations have changed a little, and many of the things that we thought originally, we've changed our minds on, I've noticed. For example, uh, when we were singing, we used to have, uh, we, we would often talk and emphatically declare that we would never be at the death. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he promised not to embarrass me, <laughs> and he did, so, um, so I get back. And Well, you know, when we met again uh, a year and a half ago, and we started, to, we started talking, we sort of, we left off, we, we just started where we left off at St. John's, we just continued the same conversations we were having. And it is true, we, we had lots and lots of jokes about not being academics and, and writing dissertations on the word day. <laughs> Anyway, I really, really was very, very happy to be invited back to the college. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here. And I, I was an extra special pleasure because I wasn't sure I was going to arrive with the weather. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be able to give something back to this college, which, which really means a lot to me. Um, I think the students, the students here will discover when they finish the college how important the experience was. I, I know as I, I go on, I appreciate it more and more. Okay, well, the name of the talk is The Power of the Point in Euclid's Elements and Steiner's Geometric Considerations. I know on the, the web it was, it, was, it was described as being about Euclid and Apollonius, so I will mention Apollonius once to justify it. <laughs> but, um, uh, but it's really about Euclid and um, Jakob Steiner. So um, the focus of the text is two, the focus of the lecture is two texts. The first text is Euclid's Elements, book three. In particular, the last three propositions, actually the last, the, the propositions 35 and 36, 37 is just the converse. These are the propositions, if you recall, about two chords that meet in a circle and the rectangles being on, that are formed in the, the segments of the one are equal to the rectangles on the other. So I'm going to look at those, those propositions. They're the main focus. And the other text is um, Jakob Stein of some geometrical uh, considerations. This is a 19th century work. And what's interesting about this work is that in part of it, these propositions reappear. And, um, and my interest in this lecture is, is the way in which those, those um, propositions reappear in Jakob Steiner's work and what he does with them. Now I have a broader or rather a smaller focus for this, for this talk and that's the point. Um, because you see, what Steiner does in this work is not so much reprove uh, 35 and 36. I'll go over those propositions in a minute. Um, what he does is that he refocuses the attention from the chords, from the chords and the rectangles formed on the segments to the point itself. And that shift, that shift of focus from the, from the rectangles to the point allows him to prove um, really wonderful theorems and solve problems almost effortlessly. So I really want to um, talk about what goes on in that shift. What, what happens when you shift the attention from those, from those rectangles to the point? 
Okay, and I think it says quite a lot about modern and ancient mathematics, and that's really what I have in mind throughout the lecture. So the order of the lecture is as follows. First, I'm going to talk about Euclid, and I will go through uh, 35 and 36 and show you how he actually proves these things. I know that uh, the freshmen probably have already, already gone through these, but I want to do it again. Then I want to show you in the second part what Steiner does with these, with these propositions in the geometrical considerations. Um, and then finally, I get to the point. Okay, so first, Euclid. Um, Euclid's book three, as you know, is about circles. And uh, these propositions 35 to 37 are the last propositions of the book, so they have a certain prominence in the book. And they're concerned with rectangles that are formed on segments of chords. The, the propositions depend on book two in a very crucial way, and also, and also 147, the Pythagorean theorem, which is also about rectangles and squares. So one thing that I want to show you is that there's a real continuity between books two and book three. And that's why I want to go through the, the proofs a bit. Okay, so let me begin with book two, though, and, book, and proposition two, five. So the proposition states as follows. If a straight line be cut into equal and unequal segments, the rectangle contained by the unequal segments of the whole, together with the square on the straight line between the points in section, is equal to the square on the half. So AB is a it's straight line. It's divided, okay, now I'll try the new technology. So it's divided in half at C, and it's divided unequally at D. So what Euclid says is that if we were to form the rectangle on the unequal bits, a, D, and D, B, this one here, and take it together with the square on the bit in between, C, D, then we would have a combination that's equal to the square on the half. Now notice that none of these rectangles appear um, in, the, in the, actually, they only stated there, but it's really referring to a straight line. Okay, we're going to see in a minute that the job of the proof is to make those rectangles appear. Okay, and let me just say uh, two six because this is the other crucial uh, proposition. Um, so here we have if a straight line is bisected and a straight line is added, so it's, so it's very similar to the other. We have a straight line here, AB, divided at C, and another bit is added here. Then Euclid says that if we were to form the rectangle on the whole straight line and the little bit added, and we take that together with the square on the half bit on CD, then we'll get a combination that's equal to um, the square on CD. Okay, so these are the two crucial propositions for those propositions at the end of book three. Okay, so I want to go through the, the proof of, of, uh, of two. I know it's familiar too, but I still want to go through it. So, um, so here is the main part of the proof, is that diagram, because that diagram is showing, is showing where those rectangles appear. They're all there. Here we have the rectangle on the two unequal bits. And here we have the square on the bit in between, and here we have the square on the half. What Euclid does in the first part of the proof is actually construct this figure. He draws the square, draws the diagonal, the lines parallel, and then he, the first part of the proof is to show that those rectangles that are in the, in the enunciation actually are appearing in this, in this figure. Okay, so, so this is really the heart of the proof, but let's still go through it. He goes, he shows that this rectangle, he, well, he states that this rectangle is equal to this one. He states it because he's already proven it in book one, of course. And um, so these two rectangles are equal. We add this square, so things equal to, added to the same things are equal. So, so this, this rectangle uh, is equal to this rectangle. Now notice this rectangle here is equal to this one. And the reason is that C, remember, is bisecting that line, okay? So this whole rectangle here is also equal to that one. And this one plus this one then, which is equal to this backwards gamma figure, the gnomon, um, this whole gnomon then must be equal to the rectangle AH. So, um, so this is equal to the rectangle AH, and now it's a simple matter simply to add, to complete the figure, and now we have the square on the half. Okay, so, so this rectangle here on the unequal pieces 
uh, together with the square, with the little square, the little red square, um, is equal to the is equal to the square and a half. So um, what I wanted you to see is is that this really, first of all, that this really is a proposition about rectangles, um, and it's very very concrete. Okay, so this is the character. This is the sort of thing that a person who is reading Euclid, um, when they go into book three, has behind them. They've, they've seen these very graphic, uh, these very graphic proofs. They know these are things are about rectangles. Okay, so now let's get to 335. And let me state the whole proposition. If in a circle, two straight lines cut one another, the rectangle contained by the segments of the one is equal to the rectangle contained by the segments of the other. So we have this, we have, so we have the circle here, and here are the two, the two lines, AC and BD, and they intersect at the point E. Okay, so Euclid says that the rectangle, so we're still, you see, we're talking about rectangles, just like in book two. Um, here, this rectangle that's formed on AE and EC is equal to the rectangle formed on DE and ED. Okay, so that, that's 35. And 36, I'll come back to 35 in a minute. And 36 says something um, that actually looks very different. Um, he says, if a point be taken outside a circle, so here, this point D, and from it there fall to the circle two straight lines, and one of them cuts the circle, so here's the one, here's one that cuts the circle, and one of them touches it, this one here, DD, which touches the circle, then the rectangle contained by the whole straight line, okay, and the bit outside there, the bit intersected between D and the, the convex part of the circle, um, the, that rectangle is going to equal to the square on DB. Okay, that's what the proposition states. It seems very different than 35. Um, but there's a, there is a symmetry between these two propositions. Because if you take uh, this, uh, this line here was really arbitrary, just said a line that cuts, that just cuts the circle. It could be any line. So for example, this line. And then again, the rectangle contained by the whole HD and DG would equal to the square on DB. And this one also is equal to the square on DB. So the rectangle contained by HD and DG is equal to the rectangle contained by AD and DC. And this is really the counterpart for 3035. Just read it in this way. Think of it as going from the point, from, from the circle to the point of intersection and then from the point of the intersection back to the circle. This happens here, and it also happens when the chords intersect inside the circle, from the circle to the point of intersection, point of intersection to the circle. So they really are uh, counterparts, but Euclid doesn't state it that way. He doesn't bring that out. You, you can deduce it, and I'm sure that we were meant to deduce it, but he doesn't bring it out in the, in the enunciation, and it's very interesting why not. Um, I claim that the reason is that, is that the proofs, where he sees the symmetry is in the proofs of these two propositions. Okay, so that we're going to see in Steiner that this is quite different in Steiner. Okay, so let's go through the proof of 35. I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of the details, but um, a lot of them. <laughs> so, well, some. Um, so here we have again the circle, and we have two chords that intersect at a point E and we have to show that the rectangle contained by AE and EC is equal to the rectangle contained by DE and ED. Now, if E happens to be, just happens to be the center of the circle, then there's not much to do, because then um, EA, EB, EC, ED, they're all radii, so they're all equal, and so the rectangles formed them are going to be equal. So, so Euclid um, takes care of that right away, and he says, um, let's assume that E is not the center, but but some other point F is the center of the circle. Okay, then what Euclid does is he, he, he draws, some, he draws some, some extra lines. He draws lines from F that are perpendicular to the two, uh, the two chords, and then he joins FE, FB, FC. He could have joined FA and FB, it doesn't really matter. Okay, then um, you have to recall something from book three earlier in the book that when you draw a line perpendicular to a chord from the center, it bisects the chord. So if we focus on AC, for example, we see that G bisects the chord AC, and E is some other point. Well, that is exactly the figure from book two. So what the proposition has set us up to see is the application of, of proposition two five. 
Okay, that's what the, that's what the, that's what the, the whole setup has made us see. And now we can apply 2,5. So 2,5 says again that the rectangle contained by the unequal bits, A, E, and E, C, and that's one of the rectangles we want, right? We want, we want this rectangle and this rectangle. So that rectangle, together with the square on G, E, is equal to the square on G, C. And then uh, Euclid applies the Pythagorean theorem, and this is the, pro I'll just run through this here to get to the main issue. He shows then that this rectangle AEC, which is the, one of the rectangles we want, remember we want this rectangle equal to this rectangle, together with the square on FE is equal to the square on the radius. Well, BD is exactly the same situation, so we can do the same, the same set of steps there, and we will get that DE, ED, which is the other rectangle we want, together with the same square in FE is equal to the square in the radius. Things equal to the same thing are equal to one another. So we can write that the rectangle AEEC together with the square on FE is equal to the rectangle BEED again together with the square on, on FE. So uh, again, uh, equals added to equals are equal. So um, we can remove FE and we will get um, what we want. So that's, that's the proof of 335. Um, and you can really, really see the application of 2.5 here and, and the way in which the proof actually sets us up to see 2.5. And the same thing happens with 336. And I won't go through the proof here, I just, just the construction. Uh, there too, we draw a line from the center perpendicular to AC. And, and again, that bisects the, sec the uh, segment. So we're set up to see 2.6. We have a line bisected at one point and another bit added on, okay? So then we can proceed in a way that's very similar. So the main thing that I want you to see here is how Euclid is setting us up to see, um, to see the, these propositions from book, from book two. So these propositions then really are about, um, really are about, about rectangles. Um, oh yeah, well before that, I will get to that in a second. I pressed too quickly. Um, so uh, this, was, this is one thing that I want you to notice about these two propositions, but there's some other thing. And it's how different it is from the, from the proofs that some of you may remember from high school. Um, the usual proof that people learn in high school is this. You, um, you have the two lines intersecting, and then you join AD and BC. You can do this also with the point outside. I just did it for this one here. And then you can show F, then you know that A is equal to B, the angle A is equal to B, and D is equal to C, because they're, they're sitting on the same arc, right? And, or E is equal, this, these, these angles are equal. So the triangles are similar. Um, and once they're similar, then we can write a proportion. We can say AE to EB is the same as DE to EC. And then, and I'm going to do the way that, the way that's usually done in, in a classroom today, you multiply. You say that AE times EC is equal to BE times DE. Of course, you, what you're doing here is that you're identifying segments with their length, and in addition to that, you're making length into a number. Um, so, uh, which is, you know, which is, which is okay, but this is, this is the way it's done, this is the way it's done, done today. And it's very, very different the way Euclid does it. And more than that, it really obscures the connection between uh, what happens in book two and, and book three. I mean, this is relying on, on the theory of proportion and ratio. Um, this proof is not only the proof that school children see today, or people who are studying mathematics see today, it's also um, the proof that someone would have seen in the 19th century. So here's, um, here's a page from Legendre des Elements de Géométrie, and here you see the proposition. Uh, the, two, the parts of two chords, AB and B, CD, which cut one another in a circle, are reciprocally proportional. That's to say, AO to DO is the same as CO to OB. And, and then the rest, he is exactly the same proof. Join AC and BD, and so on. And then he has a corollary on the bottom. And he says, thus, AO, to, he used O, I used E. Um, AO times OB is equal to DO times CO. And then he says, and there, and thus the rectangle of the two parts of the one 
uh, the, the rectangle formed by the two parts of the one chord is equal to the rectangle formed by the two parts of the, of the other. So this is the kind of proof that in the 19th century you also would have seen. Um, by the way, uh, two things about the, the Elements de Geometrie. One is that it was, um, it really was a very, very popular book. Um, it was, uh, I don't know how many, um, how many editions it went through, but it also was translated into, into English quite early, and um, it was used in America very, very widely as a textbook. Um, I know I, I have a friend at West Point who showed me, showed me West Point. This was, the book that, this was a book that they used well into the 19th century. But I've checked other books, for example, Clarot's um, Element de Geometrie. You, you see the same, the same proof. So this is a proof that somebody in the beginning of the 19th century would have seen, and this brings us to Steiner, okay, because this is probably the proof that Steiner saw of the proposition. So let's move on now to part two and, and look at Steiner and at his uh, geometrical considerations. Now, first about Steiner. This is a, he's a really, really interesting character, um, and not the least because he had very humble origins. Um, Steiner was the, the son of a farmer and his wife, and you know, and he worked on this. He worked on. Oh, I see. I, I've done something. He worked on the farm. Uh, he worked with the cows. Apparently, I mean, this was his this was his job, and he, and they say he was very good at it. Um, but he didn't know how to read or write until he was about fourteen, and there just barely knew how to to uh, read and write. Um, he was very precocious. Um, he was clearly very good in math and with numbers, and people, people talked about that. And then at 18, he did what, what 18, well, today it's a little bit, it starts at 14, but at eight, then at 18, he did what, you know, people do is they rebel against their parents. <laughs> and, and the parents do what, you know, what they, what they always do is, which is yield because they have no other choice. So he went, you know, he went, mom and dad, I, I want to go to school. So at 18, he got up and found his way to Yverdon. And Yverdon was the school of, of Johann Pestalozzi. Pestalozzi was the great pedagogue, not only of the 19th century, I think of all time. I mean, he, we still live, we still, our, our ideas in education, although modern educationals will, educationals will not want to admit it, but we still are really following Pestalozzi's, um, Pestalozzi's ideas. Well, we don't follow it entirely, we wish we would. Um, anyway, um, Steiner made his way to the school of Pestalozzi. Um, Pestalozzi took him under, under his wing, and Steiner was a tremendous success story for Pestalozzi. Within just a few years, he had mastered the program, and he actually started teaching there for a couple of years. And what's more interesting for us is that um, when he filled out a job application, and this was a job application for a teacher, he attributed his mathematical style to Pestalozzi. And this is, so this is what he wrote. The method used in Pestalozzi's school, treating the truths of mathematics as objects of independent reflection, led me as a student there to seek other grounds for the theorems presented in the course, in the courses than those provided by my teachers. Where possible, I looked for deeper bases and succeeded so often that my teachers preferred my proofs to their own. And then he goes on to say how subsequently they made him a teacher. Um, now, this search for deeper bases is really characteristic of, of, um, of Steiner's work. Almost all of his work, he's always looking for some kind of principles. And this work here on the some geometrical considerations, um, it is certainly true. And this is how he begins the work. It's a long work. It's, it's, it's really a monograph. It's an article, but it's really a monograph. Um, but it begins this way. The preliminary observations contained in the following paragraphs contain the foundation for their geometrical investigations of the, investi of the intersection of circles. From these, solutions to almost every problem concerning intersecting and tangent circles can be worked out, and indeed in most cases, very simply. Also from these considerations, a sure and visible connection will be established among problems which, which seem on first sight to be unrelated. And then just a little bit further down the page, um, he says, what the author, namely Steiner, um, was striving for, for instance, was to find the common connection lying at the basis um, of all the solutions to various problems containing tangencies of circles. So he's really looking, always looking for these, these basic principles of, of mathematics, um, these, these signs of coherence. 
Okay, so let's go on to the work itself and, and see how he actually begins. The first few sections are the places where he is setting out, finding these, these, these uh, more general bases of this. Now, it begins with a section which is called On Power with respect to circles lying in the same plane. And it begins innocently. Find the locus of all points, P, such that the difference between the squares of the distances from P to two points, big M and little m, is a given quantity. So, yeah, oh, right, right, okay. So, um, so if m, big M and little m are the points, we're looking for all the points P, so that this distance squared, PM squared, minus PM little m squared is going to be some constant quantity. And this is how he begins. Um, he very quickly, it's not a hard problem, by the way. I mean, what you do is that you, you drop a perpendicular and then you use the Pythagorean theorem and you show that um, every point along this perpendicular has the same, has the same difference of, of uh, squares. Um, so, um, so this is the locus. The locus is a line that's perpendicular to MM, okay, and that's it. And that's how it begins. It's, it's very strange because you, he's, he's advertised this as being about circles and you begin with this, this locus, line, locus problem. Okay, but notice it's a locus problem about a certain relation, a difference of squares, okay? And remember the locus because it's gonna come back, so. Okay, so let's go now on to his statement of elements 3, 35, and 36. This diagram is not from Steiner. There, is, there isn't a diagram like this. This is my diagram, okay? But I hope you'll see that it's, it's the right one. So here's how he states it. <laughs> um, he, if he had listened to me, I, I think. <laughs> so from an arbitrary point in the plane of a circle, so here's, the, here's P, um, let there be straight lines, PAB, PCD, dot, 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 so any number of lines, we're looking for any number of lines through P, be drawn cutting the circle. Then the product, rectangle, that's Steiner's uh, uh, parentheses, um, of the segments from the point to the intersection point is a constant quantity, it's a number. That is PA times PD, it looks like the, the thing from Legendre, right? PA times PD is equal to PC times PD and so on. So what we're really meant to think about are all of these lines, all of these lines going through P, and all of these lines have associated, all of these lines through P, um, one could say that this product is the same. And similarly here. Okay, so a couple of things to notice uh, here. One is that now it's one proposition. There aren't two propositions. This is one proposition, and the symmetry of those propositions is made is perfectly clear. So here we really are talking about lines through P cutting a circle. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, oops, yeah, I have to remember, oh, no. Yeah, and the second thing is that every point in the plane has now associated with it a definite number because this can be done with any point in the plane. You take some arbitrary point. Okay, so then we get to the crucial definition and that is the power of a point. So now you know my title was not just you know, the power of a point. It, it's a term in Steiner's work. So here's his definition. It's that product. The power of the point is that constant product. And here's how he states it. This product for a definite point, for a definite point in respect to a given circle, and don't forget that, that's important too, um, is the power of a point with respect to the circle. And right, right away afterwards, immediately afterwards, he says something very interesting. He says, well, we, you know, conversely, we can have the power of the circle with respect to the point. It's a kind of a dual notion. Now, I'm going to come back to that at the very end of the talk. So that's another thing to mark down, to, you know, don't forget that too. So he has this, con this, this, this dual notion as well. But right now, that's our focus. Okay, now, the next thing that he does is that he shows that the power of a point is expressible as a difference of squares. Well, how does he do that? Well, remember, it doesn't matter which line is going through P, any line could do. So what do you choose? You choose the easiest one. Mathematicians are very lazy. They always do the easiest thing. So, um, so here's the point P, and we can just take a diameter. A diameter is the simplest line to go through. It goes through the center. So let's say M is the center. 
this length of line we can say quite easily. It's the length between P and the center together with the radius, plus the radius of the circle, R plus MP. And this bit over here, the little one, is the radius minus AP, so R minus MP. If you multiply those together, remember he's thinking these are products, then we get R squared minus MP squared. And if the point is outside, we get, we get MP squared minus R, squ R squared. And, and uh, Steiner does say we can, we can do one or the other. And note again that this number is the length of the tangent. That's, we, you know, we, we learned that also in 335. That's also part of 336, I'm sorry. Okay, so with that definition, um, Steiner makes an observation, just, to, just throws it out, um, but it's very important. He says if P is on the circle, then of course R is equal to MP, so the power is equal to zero. And conversely, if the power of a point is zero, it must be on the circle. Now that tells you that we're really talking about attributing numbers to points. That, rect that rectangle in, in, in parentheses was really lip service. I mean, this is, these are numbers. These are numbers. And in fact, where it's zero is very, very important. And we'll see that in just, we'll see that in just a minute. Oh, I have to remember to, yeah. So, um, so now he goes another locus, another question of locus. Now there are lots and lots of locus problems. And he's, he's constantly saying, find the locus of points such that. Okay, it's full of, uh, in fact, all of his work is full of that, but this, this, this piece in particular. Anyway, so what is the locus of all points P that have the same power with respect to circle M and circle uh, little m? So, um, well, now we can write these things, we can write these things out explicitly. Um, suppose the radius of M is big R and little m is little r, then the point has to satisfy this. In other words, remember, this is the, this is the power of the point P with respect to M, that, that MP squared minus the radius squared. And the power of P with respect to the little one is little MP squared minus little r squared. And we can shift things around a little bit, and then we can say, well, the locus must be such that the difference of MP squared minus little MP squared is the difference of the radius, radiuses squared. Well, the radiuses don't change because the circles are given. Um, so that's a constant quantity. Should look familiar. That's, that is exactly the little locus problem that he began with. That's finding what is the locus of all points whose, whose distance of squares is some constant quantity. So we know what the answer is. And of course, he just says it uh, easily enough. It's the straight line perpendicular to MM that we showed already. And this he calls, this line he calls the line of equal powers. So all the points along that line have the same power with respect to either circle. Okay, and, and so here are some examples. And um, now, some of these examples are very, very simple to see what the line of equal powers is. For example, this one. If two circles intersect, where is the line of equal powers? Well. Look at this point here, A, and this point B. That point is on both circles. What is the power of a point on, on a circle? Zero. So this point has the same power with respect to this circle and this circle, and similar with B, it's zero. You see how important it was, that remark, um, and the fact that we can, we can say that point is zero. And we know that the line of equal powers is a line, so how many points determine the line? Two. So we have the line of equal powers. It's, it's just the common, the common chord of those two circles. What happens when the circles are, are tangent to one another? Well, in that case, again, we have this point here, which is shared by both of them, so the power of the point is zero. Um, we also know that the line of equal powers is perpendicular to the line joining the centers, so it must be the common tangent and here in this case too. These cases are a little more difficult to, to describe except to see that the line is perpendicular, but, um, but these cases are quite, are almost obvious. Um, well, they're obvious, obvious after we have these, these, these definitions. Okay, so uh, we can now state some more locus problems, which Steiner does, of course. Um, for example, what is the locus of all points 
that have the same length of the tangent to two given circles. So suppose we're given these two circles and we want to know all the points. So if I take a point here, then a point here, then this tangent is going to be much longer than that one. So we want the places where the tangent is the same to both. Well, remember the power of a point is also equal to the square of the tangent. So, so what's the locus? It's all of the points on the line of equal powers. So any point on the line of equal powers, if you can draw a tangent, um, will have the same length tangent to both circles. So we can see it in this case here, where, or this case, all of these tangents are the same. And if the circles happen to be tangent to one another, we have another locus, um, and that's this. If you take, consider this, this tangent and this one are equal because they're all from the same point. That's Euclid. Um, so all three of these lines are equal. So we can draw a circle through them. And since it's the circles through the tangent, these circles are perpendicular to one another. So the locus of all centers of circles that are perpendicular to two circles is the same line of equal powers. And these things are, are actually not so obvious if you don't have this machinery. Um, but with it, it just sort of falls out. Okay, then Steiner goes on to three circles and things get even more interesting um, and in a way more beautiful. Um, so you have three, three circles now, okay, M1, M2, and M3. These again are Steiner's. This is the way that Steiner notates it. Um, and this is Steiner's diagram. Um, so um, we want to know what happens to the lines of equal powers with respect to three, three circles. So here's one. L12 is the line of equal power, so line 1, 2, of M1 and M2. And here's another one, L23. Now maybe these lines are parallel. That's possible, okay? And if you think about it, if they are parallel, then all three lines of equal power are going to be parallel. So let's assume they're not parallel. And they meet at some point, this one and this one meet at some point P. What do we know about P? So now think of the power of point as just a number. It's just a number. The same number with respect to these two circles, okay, you have the same number, the power, with respect to these two circles. But because it's also on this slide, we have the same number with respect to these two circles. So that same number is associated with all three. What does that mean? Well, that means that these two have the same number, that same power. So with respect to these two points, P is also on the line of equal powers. What does it mean? that all three lines of equal powers intersect at a point. And now Steiner, again, just kind of says, if you read his, read it, he just sort of says, oh, and well, you know, and then we can easily see, and he hardly proves these things. You can take, for example, three circles, well, two, and here's another one, and they all intersect with one another. Now take the line, the common chord of two of them. Take this common chord. Well, we have one more common chord, and it has to go through the same point. Um, why? Because, because all, of these, all of these lines are the line of equal power. Remember, the line of equal power of intersecting circles is the, is the common chord. Um, then we have, say, say, take another case. We have these circles. We have one that's, say, tangent. And now we have this common chord and this common chord. And we take the tangent and it meets at a single point. Because remember, the common tangent is also a line of equal power. And the lines of equal power always meet at a point. Or we can take three, three circles that are tangent to one another and look at their tangents. And they meet at a point. Or we can do it internally. And they meet at a point. And these things, you try to try just to start, you know, just from scratch and prove, prove these things. It, it's not that easy. Um, even the, you know, the one where the circles just intersect with one another, it, it's, you hardly see what's given there. But once you have this machinery, it's just thrown out so easily, effortlessly. Okay, but now we have to really get to the point, okay? And, but before that, you see I promised, and now I've already gone back on my promise. Before that, um, I want to talk just, just a word about Steiner's originality here. Because there are other people who have done, who did similar things. The first name that I want to mention is, is, is Jean Poncelet. And here he is in, in military uniform. And maybe some of you know that Poncelet did some of his most, he did his mo really creative mathematical work as a prisoner of war of the Russians. But Poncelet, uh, first of all, is mentioned by Steiner explicitly. Um, 
that Poncelé did certain things that were related. Steiner was not very good about giving credit always. Um, <laughs> Um, but in a work of Poncelé, he uses 35 and 36 to illustrate a principle of continuity or the permanence of mathematical relations. And you see, what Poncelé is talking about is, again, about these, these lines that are intersecting a point that all have this same number, the same property attached to them. Um, the other, the other uh, name that I have to mention is Louis Gautier. And um, here, by the way, the internet failed me. I, 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 it didn't let me steal a picture of Gautier. I searched and searched, couldn't find. But his paper is, his paper is online. Um, so here's the first page of his paper, and we'll have to live without seeing him. Um, but Gautier proved very similar propositions, like the ones I just showed you, the ones, for example, where you have the common chords, and did them in a very similar way to Steiner. In fact, um, Steiner also talked about something like the line of equal powers, but he used a different term. He called it the, the radical axis and the place where they intersect, the radical center. And in fact, those are the terms that we still use today. We don't use the line of equal powers. We use Gautier's term. And Gautier was writing quite a bit earlier than Steiner. Steiner's paper was 1826. So this is 1813. You know, the, the reason why I, I wanted to uh, point this out is that um, Steiner, I, I think that Steiner is, is, uh, is simply expressing things that are in the air. Um, and the kind of work that he's doing is something that is, is I, I, want, I wouldn't say typical, but something that really belongs to the 19th century. So it's very important to see these other people who are doing similar, similar work. So you might ask them, why did I choose Steiner? Um, as, my, as my focus of the talk. Um, there are two main reasons. The first reason is that Steiner saw himself doing geometry. In fact, he saw himself doing geometry in a kind of classical mode, or at least in synthetic mode. He really hated algebra. So all of those people here who don't like algebra, you can, you can turn to Steiner. Um, in fact, he wrote to Schlafly, and, and Schlafly, Schlafly um, was, some of you may have heard of him, and he, he had, um, investigated um, the regular solids, but in higher dimensions. And so he, he did very important work. He was considerably younger than Steiner. Um, but they, they wrote to one, they knew each other. And he, Steiner wrote to Schleffli, when it comes to formulas, I feel like an idiot. He, he really hated this. So um, it's very, very important for me that, that these ideas are coming from somebody who is trying to be classical, and yet is betraying a modern spirit. It's, it's, if I was someone that was simply trying to be modern in the first place, it wouldn't really make the point as well. So this is one reason. And the other reason is that term, the power of a point. Um, it really shows how the issue was going to a point and attaching a number to a point. This is not at all clear in Gautier's paper, if you read Gautier's paper. In fact, he's trying to do something very, very uh, more traditional Gautier. Um, so this idea that the, power, that the point has become the focus of the tension is the other reason why I wanted to speak about Steiner and not about Gautier here. Okay, so now let's get back to Euclid. Okay. So the point in Euclid is defined as that which has no part. That's what it is. A point is that which has no part. It means it has no part to relate to other parts. So what can you really say about it? What kind of geometrical properties? You really, really can say anything. You can make any claims about the point. There is no proposition in Euclid um, that's about the point itself. Although points appear in almost every proposition, um, there is no proposition in which you can, uh, which is about the point. Just to, by the way, by the way, as there is no proposition about the unit, although units appear in every proposition about numbers. Okay, so. The point, there's nothing you can really say about it, except one thing, which I'll get to in a minute. There's one thing that you can say about it. Um, but this definition is purely negative. And um, so, you know, I mean, thank goodness for St. John's, because, because at St. John's people read that definition and they think about it. Modern readers tend to read it, they tend to say, well, this is useless. So they smile and they say, yes, yes, and then they go on to the real stuff. Okay, so um, 
then that's because of this purely negative character of the proposition, of, of the uh, definition. But not only modern readers uh, notice that it's a negative definition. Proclus also <coughs> talks about the negative character of the definition, but he draws a very, very different conclusion. And because what he says is that the negative character of that definition is exactly what makes the point fundamental. It's what makes it a principle. And it's a principle in this book of principles, this book of fundamentals. This is what he says, and he says a bit more than that. I think he says that this is a principle. By denying parts to it, um, this is uh, Proclus, in case someone doesn't know who Proclus, Proclus was a Euclid's fifth century um, commentator, one of the great commentators on Euclid and one of our great sources of knowing about Greek mathematics. He was also one of the last heads of the Platonic Academy, which is not a small point. So he writes, um, by denying parts to it, Euclid signifies to us that the point is the first principle, it's an arche, of the entire subject under, under, under examination. Negative definitions are appropriate to first principles, as Parmenides teaches us in, in setting forth the first and ultimate cause by means of negations alone. For every first principle is constituted by a different essence from that of the things dependent on it, and to deny the latter makes evident to us the peculiar property of the principle for that which is their cause, but not any one of the things of which it is the cause, becomes in a sense knowable through this method of exposition, namely Euclid's, in which the point begins the book. Okay, so the point is a principle of, of, of geometry. And the, the, the sense in which it's a principle, the sense in which it's an arche, has a lot to do, has almost everything to do, with its being a limit. Now, Proclus tells us that this is the way that geometers tend to think of a point they, in, a, in, in their practice. He says, in advancing from, this is how he begins the discussion of the point in, in his commentary. In advancing from the more composite to the simpler figures, the geometer proceeds from the three-dimensional solid to the plane that bounds it, from the plane to the line that is its boundary, and from the line to the, to the point devoid of all extension. This has often been said and is evident to everyone. So this is really, he says that the idea of the point as a limit um, is part of geometer's practice. Um, but it also, for him, is a limit in a deeper way. Um, he says that when you look at the, the dyad of the limited and the unlimited that structures the world in a way, the point is the part of geometry that's closest to the limit, to the limited. But he emphasizes that, um, that it doesn't just stay there. I mean, it's not about the limit. He says in a very interesting way, he says, possesses, the point possesses the potentiality for the indefinite in secret by virtue of which it, it, it creates all intervals. I thought about this, this word, in secret. It's very peculiar. Um, but I think I know what he means. He means that you, you, when you state a point, when a point is given, without saying anything more, the point starts looking for a line. So the character of point is also connected to the one geometrical property, because I said that there was one thing you could say about a point. And the, the idea of it being a limit is also connected with that one geometrical uh, property, and that is position. That's the one thing that a point does have, is position. Um, and in fact, Proclus makes the, po makes the point that, um, uh, that it's having position is what makes it geometrical in the first place. Because remember that a, a unit also um, is that which has no parts. It's not exactly stated that way in Euclid, but, we, we, but a unit also has no parts. So a point is geometrical because it has position. So we need to talk a little bit about what it means to be given in position. This brings us to another book by uh, Euclid called The Data. And in Euclid's Data, um, which, is, which is a book, it's a fascinating book about how geometrical objects can be given. And there are many ways in which they can be given. Um, they can be given in magnitude, for example. They can be given in form. And they can be given in position. Now, there are lots of things that can be given in position. Uh, lines can be given in position. Angles can be given in position. A circle can be given in position. And a point can be given in position. Now, what's special about a point, though, is that a point can be given only in position. It's the one thing that can be given only in one way. So when Euclid says that a point is given, he's saying it has, a, just by saying it's given, it means it has a place. In some sense, he's saying it is a place. 
more, uh, more precisely, it will stay in place. And so this is how my friend uh, Marinus Teisbach, who worked on the data for about 20 years, um, and, and if you start reading it, you will understand why. It's a very, very interesting book. And he writes the following. In the data, if a point or a line is, given, is to be given in position, it is put in the plane from the outside. Tacitly, the plane is considered as a continuum of potential positions, topoi. And from the doings in the data, we infer, we infer that axiom zero star, this is, this is uh, ties back, um, any point may be given, may be taken and appointed given. That is, put in a certain topos and meant to stay there. It cannot at some point, some stage of the theorem, occupy another topos and still claim to be the same point. It cannot metapit from metapitting hop into another topos. He's a very funny guy, uh, ties back. Um, in modern words, um, it is unique and, and recognizable. And it must stay in its position always. That is to stay till, till the curtain falls at the end of the actual proposition. So a point is a kind of anchor. Um, so a point keeps other things in place. And once they're in place, you can now start making geometrical claims about it. Um, for example, in the data you show that if two points are given in position, then the line joining them will be given in position and in magnitude. So now let's go back to uh, 335 and think about 335 in this light. Let's just sort of go through the, just the general flow of the, of the proposition. The first, the supposition is that two straight lines in a circle cut one another. Well, Data, the data, in the data we find that if, the, if, the, if two lines intersect, um, then the point will be given in position. And that means we have an anchor. And once we have an anchor, we can start thinking about the segments and we can start talking about the rectangles. And this is exactly what uh, Euclid says in the data. Now the data, I just wanna say a word. Um, the data, one of the things that's very interesting about the data is that um, many of the propositions in the elements um, appear again in the data in a slightly different form. And it's very, very interesting to see the differences. And one of the big differences, um, one of the big differences is that whereas in the elements there are sometimes two things, in the data there's one, and this is the case here. But let's see how he states 335, or the proposition that corresponds. By the way, 336 corresponds to data 91. So uh, here's data 92. If a point be taken inside a circle, given in position, the circle given in position, and through the point, a straight line be drawn in the circle, the rectangle contained by the segments of the straight line is given. In other words, the, the role of the point there is to allow us to talk about that rectangle. That's what the role of the point is um, in, in Euclid. It gives us a place and sets things up. Okay, so now let's go back to Steiner for a minute. Um, the point, look, in Steiner, the point has many of the same characteristics that it does in Euclid. It also, um, it also can mark and delimit. Um, um, but besides position, the thing about Steiner is that there are other things we can attribute to the points. Points can now have other kinds of properties, I put it that way. Numbers can be, um, numbers can be attached to it. And, um, this is like the power of the point. And I don't, I don't just mean coordinates, all kinds of numbers. The power of the point is not coordinates. Okay, and now I want to remind you again that, that little thing that he says at the end. But recall this, that the, the power of the point, can, you could also talk about the power of the circle. And that's a very, now you see, what does that mean? That means that circles and points have somehow become objects of equal weight. And therefore you can no longer speak about the point as a principle. It's now, you could talk about circles and points almost interchangeably. What was important was a kind of relation. And think about that little bit at the end with respect to a circle. Don't forget that. You can't talk about the power of the circle, the power of the, cir of the point without positing a circle. What happens when you put that circle down? Once you put that circle down, every single point in the plane gets a power every single one, and we know now, including those that are on the circle, they get power zero. So every single point without exception gets a power. 
So, the, so once you've put the plane down, the plane, the entire plane has been structured. It in a way has become a kind of a space. And this brings us to locus. Remember I said locus appears a lot in, in Steiner. Uh, locus always appears in a certain form. And it's the form that we're kind of familiar with when we hear locus. It's this, the set of all points with property P. Our ability to state things that way has to do with the plane that's, that can be structured, that points that can be given properties. You see the set of all points with property with a certain property. For example, the set of all points with the same power with respect to two circles. And I think that we, we often forget how that way of looking at locus is very, very different from the Greek way of looking at locus. I will be terrible and say that even Tolliver, at the end of Apollonius, he fills in Apollonius's locus problem. He's also looking for a locus of this form. Apollonius seems not to have done it. And so Tolliver comes and, and fills it in. It's very interesting, you should read it. But, but, um, but it's not an Apollonius, and Apollonius says that he's done it. There's a very great difference between locus in the form, the set of all points with property P, and what happens in, in, in Greek mathematics. There, a point can be on a Greek locus, but it's the locus that has the property, not the point. That's why Pappas, and so here I'm stating Apollon Apollonius, so I'm justifying the advertisement. Um, so Pappas quotes Apollonius and says that the locus of a point, what can you say, where is the, lo the locus of the point is the point. The point is, is one place, that's it. You can't say anything more. The locus of a point is a point. Okay, so now I, I have to say um, just a few concluding, concluding statements. Um, Steiner's deeper bases, remember he's always looking for deeper bases and scientific unity and coherence. These are kinds of principles. And you know, when I thought about this lecture, what I was really trying to say in this lecture, I realized, I realized that what I really am trying to say is that there's a very different sense of principle, of a principle, of an arche in modern mathematics and ancient mathematics. Because Steiner really is looking for some kind of principles, but they're very different than in Euclid. In Euclid's geometry, we witness a wealth of objects and geometrical relations that are built up from, the very, from simple objects. And in the case of the point of the very simplest object, relations and geometrical problem, uh, properties in Euclid are always of an object that's their source. And the objects have to be there in the beginning. And the beginning of geometrical objects has to be something that has no other relations. So in that, that's the way in which the point is a principle of, of, of things in, in, ge in uh, Euclid. But in Steiner, in his world, um, geometry is, is, is characterized by relations. Remember that locus problem that he begins with. He begins with this idea of a difference of squares. And the whole, the whole, um, uh, you know, the whole tune that's going through this, this work is things that have to do with this difference of squares. And he's really weaving the geometrical ideas with a kind of relation. And think about Poncelé also, about these lines that are preserving single relations. So, the principles in Steiner's world are characterized by relations that precede objects or can be separated from them. And the final thing that I want to say, and um, you know, I, whenever I read Steiner, I'm always kind of saying, ah, oh, I mean, this is, it's really beautiful. It's really, it, his, his things are so elegant and so impressive. And I always think that, oh, this is really, really nice. But you know, I have to step back and say, why do I find it so beautiful? Um, do I find, what kind of vision do I have that allows me to see the beauty in these kinds, of, these kinds of propositions? And I have to come to the conclusion that it's a very modern kind of vision. It's a kind of vision that's characterized by these kinds of, of principles. And so what I really wanted to talk about was how that vision is different uh, all through um, the uh, geometrical conceptions of, Euc of Euclid and Steiner, even in the simplest object, the point. Thank you.